Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for virtual Bulldogs Behind the Scenes, featuring a tour of Italy. Well, my name is Molly Clevin, and I'm from the University of Minnesota Duluth Alumni Relations team. Today, we are going to be transported to a few favorite spots in Italy with a special guided tour. Now to introduce our guest. I'm excited to introduce Dr. Jennifer Webb. Dr. Webb is an Associate Professor of Art History and the Department Head of the Department of Art and Design. She explores art, architecture, and the built landscape across time and space. Her research focuses on Renaissance, Italy, and the neighborhoods of Duluth. It is now my pleasure to hand it over to Dr. Webb. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to Molly and Austin and Matt for inviting me and for all of you spending your lunch hour with me uh, on a cold kind of wintry day in Duluth. I'm especially glad to have you spend a day with me uh, in Italy and in a few of my very favorite places in Italy. So as you saw from the invitation, we will be uh, spending a long and busy day um, exploring two cities. Uh, the first is a that you see here on the lower right. And the second is a view of the Adriatic uh, from the pier in Pesaro. Uh, both of them are part of the Marque region, which is one that I would encourage any of you if you're planning a trip uh, in the upcoming months and years to spend a time with because not as many tourists make it there. Uh, this is an image of me um, in Urbino. Uh, the last time I was able to go in 2019 with a group of students Students. We, I am a co-leader of a study abroad program that allows students to do what we call Experience Italy. And one of the places that we go is Urbino on a day trip from Pesaro. And so what I'm sort of doing is taking you through the kind of day that they might spend as part of this program and allowing me to introduce you to uh, these places that you might not have had the opportunity to go. I would be interested in the chat if any of you have been to Pesaro or Urbino to let me know. Um, because Urbino is uh, one of the places that people like to visit during the, their trips to Italy if they're getting off the beaten trail. So if you have been there, just go ahead and put it in the chat. I'd love to hear that from you. Uh, the Marche region is uh, basically stretches from the Adriatic coast, uh, which is right here in this red, uh, through the mountains that run down the boot. I think of them often as the zipper of the boot. That's how I describe it to my students. And that basically divides uh, this region from the places that many of you might have been, Florence and Rome. And it also is fairly isolated due to public transportation since uh, the last World War, there haven't, hasn't been a lot of train service in this region, which means that it's quiet and peaceful. And it also gives you an opportunity to experience a really wide range of landscapes within a very small area. So obviously in the coastal towns like Pace Row that you can see here on this map, uh, you get the uh, seafood straight out of the water, you will actually have their fertile plains, and then as you head uh, south and west to Urbino, which is here, you are entering into the first hills that ultimately lead to these mountains where we have some of the highest peaks um, outside of uh, northern Italy. And so on a given day, you'll see people uh, standing next to the open ocean and going snowshoeing in the mountains. So in some ways, it's pretty exciting. Uh, oh, the University of Michigan Michigan's program in Florence. I actually was part of that program. That was my first study abroad program, Douglas. So, and I'm glad to hear that you've also been to Urbino. That is very exciting. I feel like we could talk about the villa if that's where you were for a long time. Uh, so, what they're doing now, Pesaro was just last week named the cultural capital of Italy for 2024. Both Pesaro and Urbino are UNESCO cultural sites, Pesaro for music and Urbino for the arts. And so on our study abroad program that I will be sharing with you today, the students actually learn not just about the built landscape and architecture and art, but they also about music history and the music that was composed in these regions. And we also offer a class for students to make things inspired by the landscapes and experiences that I'm going to be sharing with you. 
So we're going to start uh, on the coast in Pesaro, just as we did as part of the program. Uh, this is literally the view from the hotel that the students get to enjoy. Um, and so you can see that it is a, a traditional beach town and has all of the things that you might expect. Um, and it is not very difficult to get to Croatia on the ferry from Pesaro. So it's very much connected to southern and eastern Europe as well. And so I usually start my day and I invite you to start my day. Um, on the beach in Pesaro, going for a walk, um, enjoying this modernist sculpture done by a regional leader. And um, you can see that uh, Pomodoro is the name of the architect, that means tomato, um, and he does what he calls these giant exploded uh, spheres that allow him to think about the composition of the world. And you can see that it's designed in this reflecting pool um, that aligns with the ocean. So he's really thinking about the way to bring the water into the center. And so you can enjoy that on your walk. I would also recommend that you pause to enjoy what is my favorite more drink, which is a latte macchiato. They don't call them cafe lattes. And um, that just means exactly what you might find in your Starbucks. And you would enjoy it what, with what I love most, which is one of these uh, cream coronettos. Uh, if you can ever, if you're ever in Italy, and you can find one that is actually whole wheat, and, and then um, has honey on the inside, it will absolutely be worth it with your cafe. You will start your day ready to go. And um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about my favorite foods and as we sort of move through this day together. And uh, I'm going to give you the impression that I eat and drink a lot in a given day, but I just uh, love, I think that's part of the experience of spending a day together in Italy. So from Pesaro, the group, we would get on a bus and we will take a incredibly windy bus ride uh, from Pesaro to Urbino. And this is a, a view of Urbino. Uh, it is taken from a fort that overlooks the city as a whole. It is a very small city. So it basically extends from the left edge of the image to uh, just behind this tree. I can walk the length of it in about 15 minutes. It's set on two hills that slope down from the edges and into the center where you see the a uh, palace with its very characteristic, beautiful two thin towers. Um, this is the backside of the cathedral that is actually joined to the palace by way of a corridor. And then you can see the fabric of what is ultimately a very dense medieval city fabric with winding, narrow, cobbled streets. And in the materials that Molly will be sending out at the conclusion of this is a really wonderful article, a recent one from CNN that talks about what's special about Urbino. Very little has changed since basically 1550. So you can be in and experience that medieval Renaissance cityscape just by walking through the city. It is also the seat of the University of Urbino. So it has a thriving uh, youth scene and is really energetic. And, and what I find exciting about those streets is the way that it intersects this past with this future and present. And some of the students that I've lived with when I've lived in Urbino have all really talked about the future of Italy in really inspiring ways, even while we're, you know, standing in a palace that dates back to the 1400s. So it, it has more energy than some of the other historical cities that I've visited. This was the topic of my dissertation, uh, which is the reason that I lived there. And in my dissertation, I thought about this city as well as others. And I talked a lot about these two people. This is the Countess uh, Battista Sforza of the region. She was actually born in Pesaro. And her husband, who was uh, older than her, was Federico de Montefeltro. And he was the count and then duke of this region. And his nose and face appears in a lot of pop culture uh, references. If you think you've seen his odd uh, nose, beaky nose, you probably have. There's a very famous painting of him in the main museum in Florence. Uh, he's very famous because of uh, the fact that he had a very unfortunate accident during a joust and lost his right eye. So he's always shown in profile so that we don't have to look at 
what must have been quite a uh, hideous uh, side of his face. And the other really interesting thing about him in this moment is you can see some of the uh, skin imperfections on this slide. He was not interested in creating an idealized image of himself. He wanted people to see him with all these wounds. And these are scars that he got um, when he had a, a rare skin disease as a youth. So he's really telling his story by way of his uh, face. Um, and this, this is a little bit more idealized. So he associates himself with an eagle. And that is his beak is literally a beak, um, and we don't think he actually looked quite that way. Batista, um, this was likely carved after her death mask. She died uh, quite young, but she was an incredible powerhouse. She was fluent in Greek and Latin, while Federico was out uh, leading battles all over northern and even southern Italy. She was at home running court, being a patron, uh, supporting all of the cultural endeavors and also raising a lot of children. And in some ways she is an exciting story and an example of the way that women's voices um, had an impact in the Renaissance, even when we don't necessarily see them paying the bills, they were running these households and making these spaces. So uh, Urbino is testament to both of their initiatives. So as a group, uh, we always uh, park at the bottom of the hill here. Um, this takes us a little bit closer into the city. So you can see this whole section is the palace that the two of them built together. It is most famous for this front or facade and it's multiple layers. You can actually stand on this porch and look out and we'll do that together in a second. It has a series of interesting gardens and courtyards. And then again, this is the backside of the cathedral, but you can see by way of elevation, just how hilly it is. And my students will tell you that what they remember most vividly is having to climb up super big hills uh, after they get off the bus. So we get off the bus right here um, and then walk up this hill. I'm looking back down, people are walking up. And on a Saturday, which uh, is market day in Urbino, the city is full of people coming and going and has a really interesting energy that brings together the students and the regional population. So imagine yourself walking up these cobbled streets. Uh, this is the home of Raphael. So uh, at the top of this hill, you would turn left and go up on on impractically an actually bigger hill and you would go past the place that Raphael was born. And many people argue that the work that he created in the Vatican um, in Florence was largely sort of uh, created by the cultural atmosphere of his childhood, which was in this city itself. Urbino is uh, a, a city of contrasts. So on one side, on the way up the hill, you'll pass a oratorio or baptistry full of late medieval and early Renaissance frescoes, but you're also going to see evidence of uh, graffiti, of art on the street that really brings together some of these stories. And this one uh, is amusing because you can actually see the layers of graffiti of different moments of action. We're gonna keep going uphill. Uh, this is the very top of the steepest hill. So, um, and right at the top of this hill is one of my favorite coffee shops. And so now, uh, whenever I go on trips to Europe, I think you should break up your day with walking and hiking followed by cake. So this was uh, a breakfast cake that we had after our, our walk. Um, these are two regional specialties. And uh, I always like to treat people who are with me to some of these things that they may never have eaten and may not not actually be part of our traditional understanding of uh, Italian cuisine writ large. I was trying to remember exactly what they tasted like. The one on the left was mine. And what I remember is it had sort of a, a light citrusy. It looks heavier than it was. And it went beautifully with my second espresso, espresso of the day. After we would pause for cake, I would take you over to the Saturday market. Uh, this Saturday market has everything you could possibly need in your home or for the week. Uh, on the in the middle there, you see an image of one of the fruit stalls. And uh, I think a lot about the citrus that you would have at the time. On the left, you can actually, I'm cheating a little bit here. This is a fruit stall from the daily market in Pesaro. Um, and I want you to just look at how many different tomatoes there are. Um, 
I always tell my students that uh, tomatoes are what I miss most when I return home from Italy and they always uh, laugh at me at the, before we go on the trip and then tell me that I was right when they get back and how they long for a nice bit of Italian mozzarella and a beautiful what we think of as heirloom tomato that has just come in for the farmers. You could also buy meats and seafoods at these markets. Um, when I was a student there, we bought clothes, uh, pots and pans. Uh, it really is the mall or large shopping center that we might, we might get exactly what we could get um, in the streets. And it's a really lively environment. Urbino, because it is the center of a university town, is also incredibly exciting because it has two examples of a modernist architecture that one would and does find in uh, the textbooks on architecture, modern architecture. So this is a view of the dorm that was designed for the University of Urbino by the leading modernist architect Giancarlo Di Carlo. If you are a lover of modern architecture, he was um, following in the footsteps of Le Cabusier and thinking about how to use geometry. But he also was embracing the future of concrete and its sculptural form, which I think maybe we, we don't uh, admire as much as he did. Um, and so what he did is take these ideas of concrete and geometry and ideal form, and he fused it with a tradition of medieval monasteries, where all of the individuals have their cell and you have these gathering spaces that are both private and some more public. And he translated that for the student body. And so these are little modular dorms uh, where each individual, I stayed, lived in one of them, had a little room that was like a cell and it was connect, not cell as in jail cell, but rather monastic cell, just to be clear. Um, and you had these beautiful windows because what he wanted to do is basically embed the architecture into the hillside. So imagine that we would be looking up the hill in Duluth and you could imagine terraces running all the way down the hillscape. And those are all the dorms. And actually our dorms at UMD look really similar to them in some of the design principles, which is one of the things that I love being on this campus because you can bring all of these places together just by walking through and experiencing and thinking about how there are these similarities. Uh, there were uh, some lack of successes, as there are sometimes in these experiments. These public spaces, like the one you see on the right, uh, were not as utilized as, as one might have hoped. Um, but the students gathered in the hallways in ways that Giancarlo Di Carlo didn't imagine when he was thinking about how people would use them. Uh, the views, uh, I think about the sunset looking across that hillscape of uh, often because there is nothing more magical than a sunset uh, in Urbino. And it is worth making the trip just for that. So we'll head back into town and we will go into this palace. And naturally along the way, we might have to stop for lunch. And uh, Urbino is famous for a very specific kind of sandwich, which is called a crescia sfollato. And it's a flatbread sandwich made out of flour and lard, ultimately, that you can put lots of deliciousness in. I usually put arugula and a soft cheese, and then they warm it on a panini press. I have no pictures of it, and none of my friends or students have pictures of it, because apparently all we did was eat it. Uh, my friend joked that maybe we should show some, I should show some uh, pictures of some of the greasy stains. You should also know that as a vegetarian, me eating something with lard is a little of a concession, but uh, it is the most local food. You can only buy these tortillas in Pesaro and in Urbino, and uh, you can make them, and I've tried, but this is one of those examples where going to Italy and spending the time there and eating locally um, will really have that transformative regional experience that we want our students also to have. So we're going to go inside the uh, Palazzo Ducale. This is the main courtyard with the students uh, from our last program in 2019. So you can see how many people we uh, 
try to take. This is a palace that is also the uh, regional art museum. So you get to experience the spaces that Federico and Batista and their children were living in and also see many of the works of art that were part of that region. As part of a repatriation effort, a number of the works of art that are from this region that had ended up in Milan and Florence have actually been returned to regional museums. Urbino is just one of those examples, but it takes the repatriation, the return of objects from museums uh, from a much more international scale to the regional scale to think about how you should return even smaller uh, communities their cultural histories. So this is a model that will allow you to sort of uh, see how all the pieces fit together. You can see it's a really big building built around one, two, three, four outdoor spaces. And this is the part that is most famous because of the view shed. But as you walk through it, you can see that every detail of the palace was considered. All of the fireplaces are decorated, all of the door frames, many of the uh, doors have inlaid wood that speaks to the cultural interests of Federico and Batista. They, as I said, were highly educated. He was really interested in music. He was had one of the greatest libraries. His library actually was taken to the Vatican and founds the Vatican Library because of it, the range of the collection. They were all illuminated manuscripts. Uh, they also were uh, commissioning ceramics. Pesaro and Urbino are very famous for their ceramics works. And so all of these you will see while also imagining what a palace outside of Florence and Rome and some of the bigger cities actually looks like. If we were guests of the Renaissance, we would spend probably our largest amount of time in a large reception room like this one. Uh, I'm including this picture because it uh, has the tapestries on the wall and often we forget how important tapestries were for Renaissance courts. They had a purpose. They actually helped to keep the spaces warm and cold seasonally, but they also were significantly more expensive than paintings and sculptures um, and could be rolled up and would be taken if they would go regionally to another palace. And so when we see them to scale, um, my head only comes to about right here. We can really think about the investments. Often artists like Raphael would do the designs, then these would be ordered and created in the Netherlands and then shipped back and fill these spaces. And they really were the very most expensive thing that a court could invest in. Um, and they often, because of how vulnerable they are, are less vivid or uh, visible in our uh, experiences in Italian museums just, and, and that doesn't really represent the time as well. If you were with me in this room, I would invite you to go over to one of these seats and take a look out. And what you would also see inside these seats is a history of graffiti that tells us about how this palace has been used across time. It was actually a prison and some of the prisoners spent a lot of time actually carving into all of the marble surfaces. And this is actual, some of the most beautiful graffiti I have ever seen. And so I invite you in spaces like this to look at the edges, the parts that we're maybe not supposed to look at, uh, because that's where we get to see this living history and this history that goes on and introduces a lot of different voices. The palace is also very interested in horticultural uh, conservation. So this is one of what they call the hanging gardens. Uh, it is uh, an area that we know actually had herbs and uh, flowering bushes that were used in the palace for medicinal purposes. And they are actually trying to get those historical items back. Um, you can see the small tower here. Uh, this has a spiral staircase inside of it. And you can also see these grates. This actually feeds uh, water and snow melt into a very sophisticated catchment system that allowed this palace to be incredibly self-sufficient. So this water fed into the basement that fed into the kitchens. Um, and so one of the things that I think about when I'm talking about with my students about sustainability and resource management is that we, people have been doing this for an incredibly long time. 
Uh, this is the view that I promised you from those towers, and this little uh, sculptural fellow uh, is a puti that was made by one of the students when we went in 2016, was kind of our mascot. Um, and again, you can see the way that that uh, facade looks out to the street and really commands the landscape. Federico and Batista wanted you to think about how great they were as you were coming around the corner and preparing to enter it. A little bit more on the horticulture, my friend's hand, uh, looking at some of the rose hips. We also see images of that exact same uh, plant in the wood intarsia panels inside the palace. So there's this really interesting way in which the artistic elements record a moment that they're now trying to revitalize within the living landscape of the palace. The basement has a a set of kitchens and that water catchment system and also the Federico's private bath complex. Uh, this is actually his hot tub. That's how I think about it. Water would have come out of this spout. Um, and he actually has basically a mini Roman bath complex and he could uh, get off his horse and have a nice bath and then go upstairs using his private uh, spiral staircase to his study and uh, really is creating this a space for himself. He was notorious for being obsessed with what we would think about as disease and germs now, which at the time was really ahead of it. So people joked about how he didn't want meat and vegetables prepared in the same kitchen and how he had to have a bath. You had to have clean hands at the table. Um, and this was probably a consequence of that illness I mentioned, but it's enough that we have it discussed in these documents. So on the way out of town, we'd probably stop by a couple of churches. One is the Church of San Bernardino, where Federico uh, is buried and which is dedicated to the glory of his family. His son is also buried there. Um, and you can see that some of the script and design looks a lot like the palace. Directly facing the path uh, of this church across the valley is the uh, convent where Batista was buried, and you're looking at the back side of it here. Her, she was buried in the domed area that you see the later paintings from. And this is the view from this courtyard across the valley to the church that we were just looking at where Federico was buried. Uh, the idea that they would connect with one another across this space and across time is one that um, reinforces some of the stories of their romance and how deeply they loved one another. This is also a story of reuse. This is now one of the main art buildings at the University of Urbino. So this is where you would take your printmaking classes. Um, and so you're looking at some of the student desks inside that cloistered space. And on the left, you are looking at uh, the spiral staircase that is built into the fabric of that building. And so they are preserving it and also allowing the students to inhabit it and think about future making in these spaces. So after a long day in Urbino, we get you back on the bus uh, and take you back to the ocean. And maybe you'd be done with your day and want to spend the day on the beach, which no one would blame you for. You could rent an umbrella and look at these gorgeous views and rest. But you also might want to visit the Palazzo Ducale, uh, where Batista was born and raised. And this is right in the middle of the historic downtown of Pesaro. You might want to pop into the cathedral that you see here on the left, or even stop by the fortress that Batista's brother paid for uh, that you see here on the right. Uh, this castle has never been open in all the times that I have been in Pesaro, and uh, I'm hoping that one day it will. So keep going back and experiences might be different. They seem to have August parties in there uh, sometimes. We have had the pleasure and honor each time we have been part of the program to go inside the Rossini Conservatory. So Rossini, the very famous opera composer, was born in Pesaro and at his death lay, left an enormous amount of money to establish a music conservatory. And so we will go and visit the students there. This is the 2013 group sitting looking at uh, students at the conservatorio. 
They have some of the original manuscripts that Rossini created in this space, and we have been given access to that archive. One of my most vivid memories is when Jefferson Campbell, who uh, taught, teaches music history class, um, and I were in the archives for the first time, the archivist uh, handed Jefferson a manuscript that was actually dated to the 15th century so he could hold it in his hands, and I thought that he might collapse on the spot. He was both so excited and so shocked by it. Um, and so the students get this absolutely a momentary impact with the original materials. And then they invited us into their practice rooms. So the students at the conservatory, this is just, you know, their practice space. So here the horns are getting together and uh, we were invited in to see what they were practicing. And lo and behold, they played a, a Star Wars march for us in this Renaissance space, uh, in this palace. And uh, you can see that some of our students are filming it because it was this, again, this moment where all of these different layers of history come together. These frescoes tell the story of Pesaro, which was a, a, a Roman city, a very important harbor on the Adriatic coast. And then they paid for all of these beautiful frescoes that celebrate that history and that glory, and then also celebrate it for the next generation. Pesaro also because it is the center of uh, opera is also a place where you think, learn a lot about staging and uh, sets. So the museum that we take students to has this uh, set design actually preserved in the fabric of the city. And this is our 2016 group, uh, Robert Rapinski taught the art class. Inside this museum is my absolute favorite altarpiece. Here is me standing in front of it. It is by the Venetian painter uh, Giovanni Bellini, whose work you often always have to go to, pay, uh, to Venice to see. But he did this project for Pesaro. This was recently conserved, so my students will see it newly cleaned. Um, and we often, because this is a quiet museum, can literally sit down and talk about it in, in front of it for hours. And the students can really look closely and think about how the art was meant to be seen in, in absolutely wonderful ways. And you can see by looking at it how carefully uh, Giovanni Bellini uses color. There's this richness in the purple and pinks and blues that show light and shadow. And um, local saints that are connected to the region. And this includes some of the saints that uh, we have connected to some of the Pellucci families as, uh, as well. After visiting the museum, we would take a passeggiata. This is the Italians go on an evening stroll. Uh, they do some shopping. They check out some street art. These are my favorite little cats that popped up in Pesaro everywhere. They might stop for an aperitivi. So with your beer or cocktails, you get this incredible spread of snacks, usually regionally inspired, uh, or a gelato. A couple of times when I've been in Pesaro, they have had a gelato festival. And so stopping and pausing and resting and eating and enjoying um, is part of the experience. Uh, the passeggiata can last for hours. The Italians usually don't eat dinner until 9 p.m. And in Pesaro, you can have, be in a restaurant that looks out over the Adriatic while eating uh, seafood that came on with the boats only hours earlier. Uh, you can have a picnic lunch dinner like we did from the supermarket, again, with those incredible tomatoes or a pizza like this um, and salad and wine. And then to end our day, I, we would go together to the theater, the Rossini Theater, which has incredible acoustics. It is a early example of a Baroque theater with the theater boxes. And uh, you can see all of the people attending what was when we went, we got to see a bassoon concert. And the students absolutely get to then think about uh, what it means to sit in an opera box and go to a concert in a Baroque space uh, after a day spent in Pesaro and a day spent in Urbino. And then at the end of the day, we walk by the Palazzo Ducale and enjoy the Adriatic 
and uh, that is a day with me in Italy. So I wanted to mention the contact information for those of us who are hosting. And uh, please feel free to email mail me anytime and the alumni organization. And then I'm going to stop sharing and I'd love to talk more and answer any questions you might have. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Webb, for that tour. Um, we are now going to transition to our question and answer portion of the webinar. And I know that there were quite a few questions that were submitted ahead of time. And I was trying to take notes during your presentation. So hopefully we're able to address all of the questions. Um, I think to start us off, uh, wondering about the ease of travel and traveling on your own in Italy when you don't speak Italian. So if you have any um, pointers or tips on that. So I uh, went to Italy as part of that study abroad program in Florence without knowing a word of Italian. And we don't have Italian here at UMD, so our students face this often. And what I tell them that is that the Italians are actually quite fluent in English. Most of them take English throughout their uh, educational experiences, but that I encourage them also to try and learn some of the basics, the please and thank yous that really show your respect and interest. And especially when you're going to go to the markets, uh, I found that talking with my hands is very, very good. I've done, I do a lot of pointing and gesturing. And um, the Italians also, if you know any Spanish, there's a lot of overlap there. And so a number of our students have taken Spanish. And so, but I have only encountered um, a lack of friendliness in this case in the really touristy areas where I think the Italians are fatigued sometimes by it. But in the smaller towns, uh, they are generally really excited and really patient. So there was actually a follow-up question to that um, and you sort of uh, touched on it a little bit, but the best way to get to know the people of Italy, um, smaller villages rather than the urban. Yeah, in my experience, um, I, I think that there is a openness to just uh, getting to know people in the smaller towns. I have been very fortunate to be able to live in a variety of uh, Italian cities and to get to know people in different contexts. And I do think putting yourself out there and just, uh, you know, you go to the same coffee shop every day, people will begin to know you and, and talk to you. I have lived in Venice and Florence and Urbino. And so I have uh, this sort of variety of experience. And then in terms of getting around, do you have any recommendations on transportation? I know there were a few questions about um, bike tours, walking tours, um, if you have any recommendations around that. So I think that the Italians have um, had an interesting, or at least in the Marche, have had a very parallel experience to us. Uh, there is more talk of walking tours and getting outside as groups that I have ever seen. Pesaro has really invested in their bike infrastructure. So there are bike lanes and bikes that you can uh, rent it's also embedded very close to a park that has mountain bike trails. And so you can also uh, mountain bike there. Uh, sometimes I think that my entire social media feed is people hiking and mountain biking in different countries. Uh, I also really recommend the leisurely walk where you get a little bit lost um, and see where you might come across. In places that there are bus tours um, or even water tours, they're a good way to get to know a place first, and then you can figure out where you want to explore further. I mean, in spite of what I said about the train, the train to Pacero is really easy, and the buses from Pacero to a number of the small towns in the Marque are robust, but you have to be patient, and uh, it might mean going through a lot of transitions. So often when I'm doing research trips, I will rent a car. And then transitioning to food, I know you talked a little bit about that, but was there anything that surprised you about the food scene? 
Well, when I went for the first time, I, like many of my students, was very startled by the fact that tiramisu doesn't look the way I thought tiramisu would because uh, it's really been reverse engineered by Italy to meet the, Ital the Italian-American demand for it. So the most surprising tiramisu I had ever eaten was in Venice, where it had no cream and was all gelato or ice cream. Um, I think what often surprises me is that, you know, when we... When an American goes to an Italian restaurant, you're faced with all these courses. So there's usually um, some antipasti, then there's a, a primi piatti or a first course and a second course, and then a, a side sides and then dessert. And you think, oh gosh, to have the real Italian experience, I'm gonna have to eat all of this. But then you notice that the Italians actually don't do that except really on very special occasions and around Sundays. And so they'll often as a couple share a pasta course and a meat course and have some spinach on the side. Um, and so it, I, I think that, and, this, and the, the portions are, I would say much more human scaled than sometimes we get in our American restaurants. So I come back from Italy and I'm uh, again startled by what our proportions are in the United States. Um, and for me, the, the, I, I love roast potatoes. Uh, they are regionally different all the time and the greens are different. Uh, again, as a vegetarian, I can't speak to the meats, but I do know that the, another of the cities that we go to, Ferrara, is center of the Italian slow food movement. And that movement has been in place for a long time and their, their food is spectacular. And then I, you were mentioning the Urbino specialty sandwich. Um, there was a question that came in on just how do you spell that? Um, that is included in the sources. Okay. So a recipe. Um, and so because I couldn't find a picture and again, I did a di deep dive, there'll be lots of information about it. Uh, Crescia is C-R-E-S-C-I-A. Sfogliato is folded basically. So you'll be able to find it. Wonderful. And then transitioning to um, some of the art and music, um, you had talked about the Rossini Conservatory. And there was a question that came in wondering about how often the concerts are performed um, with Renaissance instruments. Yes, they have a opera season and that's usually with modern instruments. And I have not been to many concerts there that actually use Renaissance instruments. They have a small museum where they're on display, but because their focus is on students who are um, studying now, it tends to be uh, that focus. And in fact, the expertise of the conservatory is electronic music. They have a really sophisticated lab where people um, and a negative space room so that people are really thinking about new technologies very heavily in this Renaissance palace. And then is there ever any dance incorporated with uh, these concerts? Not in the concerts, but there is a, another performance venue that is actually right next to the Palazzo Ducale in Pesaro that is largely a dance space. And that's where I see the most experimental dance going on in Pesaro. They have recently opened a contemporary, a couple of contemporary art galleries as well as part of this cultural capital initiative. And then in Urbino, there are more concerts inside the Palazzo Ducale with traditional instruments. Um, and there's less dance there. I would say that Pesro is thinking about contemporary making in really uh, innovative ways. And then um, again, transitioning now to a little bit more of the history, um, going back to the tapestries, were those created primarily by men or women of the time? Yes, so most of the workshops, as far as we know, are run by men and uh, include male teams. Uh, there is some discussion about whether there were some women who were designing for it, but it's still an area there's with, where there's been um, some additional research. But we do know at this scale, especially when we're talking about the rich guys buying stuff from other guys, um, it is largely a male dominated field. And then a question just came in about wondering a little bit more about the baths and the cleanliness and if that was typical for the time. Um, it is not. 
Yeah, um, Frederico was um, an interesting fellow, and we know a great deal about how his household was run because in the generation of his son, a uh, manual was put together basically telling people uh, in different staffing roles what their jobs were. So there was one guy, uh, one person whose job entirely was to open and close doors. And included in this is a description of the cleanliness and table manners, and it also mentions the fact that Federico was very interested in charity, so he gave um, uneaten food and supplies to people who might be um, experiencing hardships, but he didn't want those people inside the palace because he was worried about um, illness passing into the community. So he created a space out just outside the palace where people would go and basically pick these items up. And we suspect the people thought it was a little kooky because they actually describe it like they talk about it, about him. And if it was normal, it wouldn't have been worth mentioning it in biographies and in other contexts. Uh, the bath complex is itself an engineering spectacle. And uh, my students laugh at me because I really love talking about engineering. So the guy who really put together the designs for this palace, Francesco Di Giorgio Martini influenced Leonardo da Vinci and he invented the sort of flat spiral ramp that allowed horses to go up quickly so that their hooves wouldn't actually slip. He also created a very slight incline to feed into the water catchment systems, uh, very innovative military architecture. Um, and he's the one who created sort of the duct and heating systems needed to create this mini Roman bath complex with a cold pool and a hot bath and sort of a, a tepid bath area. Well, and you had mentioned that Urbino has changed very little since 1550. Is that how old the palace is on, or when was that built? So the palace um, basically was built from uh, early in, basically through the 15th century, so the 1400s, with a little bit of work done into the uh, 1500s. And it uh, was really done beginning in Federico, sort of in the 1440s. Um, and then after he dies in 1482, his son comes into power. It's during his son's reign that the Book of the Courtier is uh, put there. And if any of you are literary people, the Book of the Courtier was translated into loads of languages and was really influential. It's set at this court in that palace. And then unfortunately, Guido Baldo was sterile and so didn't have any kiddos. And uh, he adopted someone else. That family ultimately ended up being uh, the popes. And so the popes basically took everything from Urbino, including the seat of power to the Vatican. And that was sort of the, the city almost froze in time then. And then I think just to wrap us up for today, is there any um, kind of pointers or tips that you would like to leave with our guests when they, they were to travel? So I've, I've traveled a lot by myself, um, and I think that can be intimidating, uh, but I have found that um, there is some beauty. I, I love a morning walk in any city no matter the season, I, I think watching cities wake up uh, really gives you insight into the local experience. I, I mean, I do that even in American cities. So I would encourage you to get up earlier and stay up a little later and just be, be in the city. And have you ever had alumni join you on any of the study abroad trips? Uh, no, we, we dream of that, maybe a, a plan for the future. Um, we, we would, uh, this year we are taking 31 students, uh, it will be there in two months, and uh, that's pretty much the maximum, and um, we're, we're hoping maybe we'll, we can repurpose it and rethink it for a, um, a different audience too. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today, and for those of you that this is your first time joining us, our office alumni relations averages about one to two of these sessions a month, and uh, Dr. Webb was our first one taking us abroad. So um, thank you so much. And again, we'll follow up with an email with those resources that um, Dr. Webb has included. And then um, we'll follow up with the recorded link um, later on. So thank you so much. And we hope to see you soon. Thank you, everybody. It's always a pleasure to, to be with everybody.